This is Wickham Sound. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of The Art Show here on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I am your host Dane Cobain. This is the weekly show where we share local arts, news and events. We have a different guest on each week. We play some local and unsigned music. We have a weekly episode of The Rye Light Zone which is usually a short story or a poem. And later on we're going to be heading over to Twangling Jackford over in the Elk Shed. As always you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk And I particularly want to hear from musicians, poets, anyone with MP3s that they might like to share on the show, anyone who think that might be a good guest, or anyone who has any news going on. And that actually brings me on to this week's news. And the main thing here that I want to give a shout out to is Victoria Snaith of Dreadfuls Theatre. She's actually, uh, she's planning uh, an online theatre uh, workshop, a puppet making workshop to take place in conjunction with Wickham Art Centre. But she's also recently made these wands that she's uh, had for sale. And I commented on her Facebook telling her that uh, Ollivander has got competition. So they're really good, they're really cool wands. If you if you know anyone who's a wizard and who needs a wand, definitely check out Victoria Snaith and Dreadfuls Theatre. Uh, if you look for the Facebook page, you'll be able to find the info there, and also she has an Etsy. Before we get any further, I am gonna give a little shout out to our Facebook page as well. If you join us on Facebook by searching for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you can get updates on who's gonna be on the show, what we're gonna be featuring, links to all the catch-up stuff, and you can listen to shows on catch-up on your favorite uh, uh, podcast platforms, so Spotify, iTunes, we're on uh, Buzzsprout as well. Again, just search for the Arch on Wickham Sound. So, we're going to go into the Rye Light Zone, which is where we have a story or a poem, and we're going to be doing the first in a, th in a three or possibly even a four parter today. So, this is A Stone's Throw, it's a short story that I wrote. Uh, it's a historical fiction piece that's set in West Wickham, so it's like a local themed piece as well following a local ghost story and this was published in a book called uh, Local Haunts which was an anthology of horror stories from all over the world so uh, this is read by Susie DeMarco so thank you to Susie for helping out with this this is part one of A Stone's Throw It was a dull October evening shrill winds blew over the Chilterns and a fine mist of rain flew in the faces of the patrons who braved the darkness to show their haggard faces in the George and Dragon public house. It was the year of our Lord 1780, and despite the foul weather, business was booming. Suki, the teenage barmaid, wished it wasn't. The landlord didn't own her. He had hired her from a pool of willing candidates because she had a beautiful singing voice and the kind of awkward confidence that the job called for. But sometimes it felt like he did. It was always fill this and empty that. Sometimes he sent her down into the cellar to track down a special bottle for the well-off visitors that stopped in as they traversed the rugged landscape. She hated it down there. Sometimes she thought she heard voices. On this particular night, the Georgian dragon was short-staffed because John Woodinge had fallen from his horse and broken his ankle. Old John was the pub's owner, a member of the gentry who had fallen on hard times and established himself in that peaceful corner of Buckinghamshire. Unable to walk and ordered by the physician to take to his bed until the bones started to fuse back together, he had left Suki and her brother Thomas in charge of the place. But Thomas was as much used to Suki as a chastity belt would be to Molly Ford, the wretched whore who plied her wares and her body under the eaves of the stables when the dragon's drinkers went out to check on their horses. She wasn't allowed inside the pub, a respectable establishment, unless she was invited inside by one of the patrons and led into one of the private rooms that travellers called home when they were passing through. More ale, wench! Suki sighed adjusted her dress and carried a flagon across to the three young men who had been sitting by the fire since the sun had gone down. "'I'll have none of that, George Barber,' she said, filling the young man's cup while avoiding his eyes. "'I knew your mother, you know. She wouldn't stand for this.' "'Aye,' George replied. "'Pap, it's a good thing she's with the Lord.' "'Oh, damn the Lord,' said the lad to his right. His name was Harry Baker. "'It's not the Sabbath. The Lord can wait.' The only lord around here is that Lord Dashwood, said the third. Suki turned to face him, a scarlet flush stealing its way onto her face. 
And I'll have none of your blasphemy either, James Smith, Suki said. I know your mother too, need I? But she was interrupted as Jim scowled and reached round to pinch her on the backside. Suki flinched, spilling her ale onto the table and into his lap. I hope you're going to clean that up, Barbara said. Oh, go hang, Suki said. I have other customers to serve. And she did too. Despite the inclement weather and the fact that there were a couple of competing inns in the village, the Georgian Dragon was ever popular. It was where the labourers went to relax after a hard day's work on the fields. Suki preferred to listen than to speak, and it meant that she got to hear most of the gossip in the village. The Georgian Dragon was the closest thing the village had to a newspaper. There was a sudden gust of wind and the squall of a small-scale tempest as the door opened and a stranger walked into the pub. The punters paused their conversations and looked up appraisingly before turning their eyes away from the door and back to the faces of their drinking buddies or the playing cards on the booze-stained tables. The breeze caught the candles and blew a third of them out. Can a man get a bite to eat in this godforsaken village? The stranger's voice was well educated, with a hint of something almost foreign and exotic. He was young. Not as young as the three boys from the village, but he had a short mess of unruly brown hair and piercing blue eyes that shone with a fierce intensity. He had a good natured smile on his face and was dressed well in the luxurious vestments of the wealthy. His eyes alighted on the various tables in the semi-gloom before settling on the little Suki. Better known by her elders as Susan Keane, the daughter of one of Lord Dashwood's liverymen. You there, he said. Oh, my dear, what brings you to a place like this? No, no, never mind that. What have you got in your pantry? Suki readjusted her apron again and forced the biggest smile that she could muster onto her tired, duty-worn face. She spoke to the man as she walked over to the fire, lit a piece of kindling and used it to re-illuminate the snuffed candles. It was a job that she did so often that she wasn't even aware she was doing it. "'If it please you, sir,' she said, "'we've got bread, mutton and cheese. We may also have some pigeon, some eggs and some veal.' "'If it please me,' he repeated with mock politeness. "'And is it good?' I do say it's the best eating this side of the Y. Someone laughed into his pint, and someone else was talking loudly about the highwaymen who were still rumoured to be at work in the roads over by Aylesbury. Around them, the drinkers were still drinking and the talkers were still talking, but he was a stranger to these parts, and the locals couldn't help stealing the occasional glance. I'll take a plate of whatever you can give me, the stranger said, and brandy, bring me brandy. As you wish. Thomas Keane had been at the bar, supping on a drink of his own and observing the situation. It was he who descended the steps into the cellar to bring out the brandy. He had no fear of the darkness. Susie was left to busy herself in the pantry, and then in the kitchen. She emerged several minutes later with a platter for the visitor, who'd seated himself in a corner and who was already smoking shag tobacco from an ornate pipe. "'Here you go, kind sir,' Suki said. "'Forgive me for prying, but do you have good coin?' "'Aye,' said the man. "'I have coin enough. "'Tell me, what do they call you?' Suki adjusted her dress again for the fourteenth time that evening and said, "'They call me Suki.' "'Suki,' the man repeated thoughtfully. "'Tis a beautiful name for sure.' He paused for a moment to take another lungful of the tobacco plant. Then he said, "'You've no cause to ask for my name, but I shall give it to you anyway. I am Charles Dashwood. Perhaps you've heard of my uncle Francis?' "'Lord Dashwood,' Suki murmured. "'Aye,' the stranger repeated. "'The very same. See how I sign my name.' He reached into the pockets of his long coat and drew out an old, stained-looking letter. The signature was scrawled in black ink in a large, untidy hand. "'Please, sir,' Suki said. "'I can't read.' Dashwood paused for a moment and then started laughing, gulping up huge lungfuls of the in-stale air. "'Oh, my dear,' he said. 
I might have known. Then you must keep that piece of paper, and you must one day learn to read it so that you can see that my name is what I say it is. I say it again. I am Charles Dashwood, and my uncle is Lord Francis. Suki had heard of Lord Francis Dashwood, of course. He owned the whole village, though he hadn't been seen in public since before she'd reached womanhood. But that didn't matter. Suki had heard the tales. It was an open secret throughout the village that Lord Dashwood was the leader of the Hellfire Club. Dashwood, along with a number of other preeminent men from Buckinghamshire and nearby Berkshire, used to meet at the Medmenham Abbey on the banks of the River Thames, for nights of drunkenness, debauchery and devil worship. Their motto was Fe si qui voudras, which meant do as you please, and it was said that Sir Dashwood himself was the most blasphemous of all. He had administered the sacrament to his tame baboon. Later he had created work for the people of the village by having them hollow out the hellfire caves, barely a stone's throw away from the Georgian dragon. And then the hellfire caves became the new home of the hellfire club, and that was when things became very strange indeed. They the same they that drank themselves into stupors in the front room of the Georgian dragon, said that the caves were a breeding ground of moral turpitude. The men who'd helped to build it said that devils and demons were carved into the walls and that they moved around when no one was looking. There was a stream somewhere, far beneath the surface, which they called the Styx. And deep down there, in the darkness, there was a temple located directly beneath the church and its golden ball which graced the hilltop and dominated the skyline. "'I've been down there, you know,' Dashwood said, as though he'd read and interrupted her thoughts. "'The temple. It's hell, quite literally. Heaven above, hell below. They worshipped Christ on high and the devil in the temple beyond the sticks.' "'You barely look old enough, sir,' replied Suki. Oh, no, no, he said, waving a hand dismissively and coming dangerously close to sending his drink tumbling onto the floor. Not to one of the ceremonies. There were rumours about the ceremonies, too. The members of the Hellfire Club were said to have taken young girls down there to sacrifice their virginity. That's what happened to Molly Ford. Suki shivered. I shouldn't like to think of such things. Then you won't want to hear about the ghost of Paul Whitehead, Dashwood said. More's the pity. Sir, I've heard tell of Mr. Whitehead, Suki said. And pray, tell me what you've heard. They say he was a poet, Suki replied. That he was, Dashwood said. And, like all poets, he was a madman and a lecher. He was also the steward of the Hellfire Club. He interrogated the new recruits and scored them on their ability to swallow port and claret. He was also my uncle's lover. Suki made a sign of the cross and darted her eyes nervously around, searching for her brother, and delighted only on the three boys from the village, who were watching the conversation and quaffing their ale in near silence. It's been six years since Whitehead passed, Dashwood continued and my uncle's health has been deteriorating ever since. Did you know that he left my uncle his heart? His heart? His heart, Dashwood repeated. He left it to my uncle in his will. His body was buried in Teddingham, but his heart? His heart was buried in the depths of the mausoleum. Suki shivered again. Then she took herself, and Charles Dashwood, by surprise. She started to sing. So that was part one of A Stone's Throw and we'll be moving on to part two of that next week so be sure to listen out for that. In the meantime we're going to listen to some music and this is Straight Eight with New Orleans. Come on, everybody take a trip with me, yeah. Down the Mississippi, down the New Orleans.
The One Can Trust, our local food bank, helping vulnerable families and individuals across High Wycombe and South Bucks. Right now, there's a greater need than ever, and we really need your support through online cash donations. Whatever you can spare will be gratefully received, so that together as a community we can make a big difference. Just visit onecantrust.org.uk forward slash donate. From all of us at the One Can Trust, thank you. This is an appeal from Wickham Homeless Connection. People who live on the streets are incredibly vulnerable. Wickham Homeless Connection work all year round making sure no one ends up living on the streets. They need your help to ensure anyone locally who might otherwise be homeless is safe and secure. And to make sure no one is homeless during the coronavirus pandemic. Just £5 a month can help them continue to support people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Visit their website at www.wyhoc.org.uk or call 01494 447 699 to find out more and to give today. Every gift helps. Thank you. All your business questions answered. Throughout April, HW Bidco will be hosting a series of webinars for local businesses. Join our panel of legal, HR and finance experts who are giving away their advice for free to help businesses navigate the COVID-19 challenges ahead. For more information and to register, visit the website hwbidco.co.uk. Earth 
like rabbits To reach the inner core To discover all the magnets Looking up at night You can see a million things All of which should help you As you open up your wings Everyone is waiting for your mind And all it brings Deep inside your thoughts Is a melody that sings Far beneath the sun And still a million miles away Whispers echo harmonies That ring upon the day A peaceful intuition That was Starlight by Humans Can't Reboot, and before that we had New Orleans by Stray 8. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM, Wickham Sound, and it is time for this week's interview. So we're going to have a chat to Karina Ludmilla Cristea. She is an indie author in a variety of genres, and both fiction and non-fiction. Over to Karina to uh, tell you some more. Uh, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Oh my god. <laughs> uh, the last book that I read... Um... I'm not sure what was the last book that I read because what happens, I've started several books mm -hmm. at the same time and at this moment I have several ones started that I haven't finished. So, for example, I'm currently reading The Neverending Story by Mike okay. Landy. I can't think of the book that I... Oh, it was probably your book, actually, <laughs> uh, The Tower Hill Terror. Yeah, that's yeah. probably the last one that I finished uh, recently. Cool. I can think of... And yeah, as, um, as um, to how I felt about it, I enjoyed the the relationship between the detective and his assistant. Uh, most of most of it, um, <laughs> most of the, the things that I liked, uh, most of it. Yeah. Cool. Um, and obviously, uh, you're an indie author yourself, and there are quite a few. Uh, you know, we actually know quite a lot of the same authors from the community and stuff we're in. Um, yeah. But do you, do you go out of your way to read other indie authors? You know, actually, I I was doing that last year, but not as much as I would like to do. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking at the end of uh, 2020, for 2021, I was thinking that I want to read more independent authors. And because I'm trying not to buy, I'm, I'm trying to buy as uh, few physical books as possible at the mm. moment not because i don't like them i like them very much but in case i have to move uh, there's always that issue so i've been trying to buy physical books that i, I just really want to see and yeah. to have, hold in my hands but i want to to do this kind of thing for the next few months and in the future to connect with more independent authors and maybe do like exchange books between us yeah um and just um not necessarily review our books unless we want to but just to to do that kind of exchange but also if i find a book that i really that it really appeals to me um i will read it anyway yeah uh, independent yeah. independent book i mean uh, but the thing is, I've been doing lots of things lately. I've been doing lots of uh, genres, you could say, like uh, children's books, uh, horror mm -hmm. books, uh, romance books. So it's a bit uh, not difficult, but it's a bit strange to to like say, oh, I am just going to read this. So I want to connect just with those kind of people or those kind of authors. So, yeah, I'm totally up for reading more uh, independent authors. I think uh, we live in a great time at the moment uh, uh, regarding writing and publishing because we have access to a lot of original material. Yeah. Obviously, not everything is material, but in terms of creativity, I think the indie publishing is a, it's a great uh, way of discovering new, new stories, new, peop new people. So... That's a very long answer. But, no, 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 it's yeah. perfect. Cool. And um, obviously, you've got some books out yourself. 
so are they um, are they self published? Are they indie published? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? You know, the the road to publication for you. Yeah, so I've got like seven books, <laughs> but they're all not, not uh, three of them are similar in terms that they're children's books, mm -hmm. kids' picture books, uh, and they were all, they were all released last um, last year in 2020. But then I have a, a horror book, a collection of short stories, I, which I think you've read. That I one. have read that one, yeah. Um, yeah. Got, uh, what's whis whispers, right? Whis is it whispers, whispers is another book? strange stories. That's yeah, one, yeah, I wrote in 2019, which that one is also available as an audio book, which cool. I think it's a good idea to have as a as an author. Mm. Uh, have your books in more formats. It opens us to a variety of uh, uh, opportunities. Um, yeah, I've got a non-fiction book, <laughs> which was my first published book. And by the way, yeah, because you asked me, they're all independently published mm -hmm. um i prefer using the term independently published <laughs> but yeah self-publishing independent publishing is kind of similar although for me independent publishing means a bit more um giving more attention to the material even if it's it's created within a small team maybe the author and better readers editor things yeah. like that but yeah, it's not with a traditional publishing house. Although I, I hope in the future, traditional would, will mean independently publishing as well, uh, yeah. independent publishing as well. When we refer to writing or like books, I hope it will become the norm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So who's, uh, who's in your publishing team? Well, my publishing team is very small, but I'm very fortunate uh, in terms of beta readers. Last year, especially at the end of 2019, well, 2019 and 2020, I've uh, connected with a lot of um, <laughs> very smart people and very kind people as well in terms of that they can read the text. Like, obviously, they're, they're, they're readers. They like to read a lot, but they're also, they know how to read the text and spot mistakes. Yeah. And even like for um, not just grammar mistakes, uh, but just little tiny things. Sometimes maybe I, uh, they escaped me and they pointed out that maybe they didn't like something or they thought maybe it's not appropriate to what I'm actually trying to say in a particular story. So I've been very fortunate, although there's only a few of them, uh, I've been very fortunate to, to have them in my my bet um, in my team <laughs> in terms of my team like mostly my better readers which are some of my friends and there's also like independent authors or, or i think they might be hybrid authors one of them i'm not sure felix blackwell if he's actually independently published mm -hmm. now or not um but yeah he's an author himself and he read my book, uh, my horror book, <laughs> because he's an hor uh, he's mm. a horror on uh, horror author, so he read my collection of short stories. Um, but yeah, in terms of design, I I do most of the, the design and formatting myself, so that's why I'm saying my my team is very small because my beta readers some are very good that they are also good at editing. Yeah. So sometimes I can use them as my editor, not necessarily. Um, I, I mean, obviously, so I pay some of them, but uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> most of them are they just read the material because they love it. Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, they like to obviously help me. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, and they get a, they they get a sneak peek and get to read. Yeah, it I think it's that's released, what they so. like. Because I used to feel like several years ago when I was maybe in 2013, 2014, I was even shy to share my material with other people mm. i was because i wasn't confident enough that i didn't know i mean i like some bits but they weren't i don't know i wasn't comfortable sharing them with other people so i wasn't like yeah i, I just kept it for myself or i was sharing it with very very few people starting to share it with other people in writers groups maybe but it depends that's not necessarily the best way for everyone 
um, depends how sensitive you are as well and depends what kind of material you are, you have and also you don't really know who you're going to encounter online when yeah. with my recent better readers like from 2019 and 2020 although it's uh, only a handful of them uh, I can I'm very comfortable giving them my material because I, I have some of them that are very critical of the material but they're not like hurtful like they know how to put it in a way to say okay so you've done that there but maybe they're not like sometimes people don't know how to <laughs> navigate yeah. that line or just to say you could do something better or they say they liked something but they didn't actually say what they liked or even worse they say they didn't like it but they don't know what they didn't like or how, how it can be fixed yeah. which is not very helpful as i'm sure you know yeah okay. exactly so yeah I'm, I'm i'm quite happy especially in the last um, year or so with the feedback i received on my material awesome yeah. and and so one of the things that i want to ask you about which i think is quite interesting uh, obviously you you said you've written horror and you've written for children <laughs> and those are two very different uh, things yeah. What's what are some of the the differences of working on the two and, and um you know what are the challenges of going from one to another? Um <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, challenges. I guess it works um differently on your mind obviously because when you work for example because uh, I think that's the best way to explain it. Um several years ago I was working on a psychological novel kind mm -hmm. of like a thriller horror not necessarily horror but more like a thriller so if you write a kid's book obviously for kids um, at least my stories I like to have them um, heartwarming <laughs> a bit like positive you know you don't want to write um, I mean you can try to write uh, very some traumatic things which I kind of did with some of my books but they're obviously not like very explicit they're a bit more in the substance of the text yeah. in the essence in the story not necessarily like you have a plot that's very uh, traumatizing you have maybe a serial killer um, so I don't know the challenges I guess it, it could help you could play with your mood a, a lot yeah. For me, uh, especially like after I finished uh, my collection of short stories, like um, in 2019, um, I was also, I think I've written some kids' stories, or maybe that was at the end of 2018. Um, basically, I couldn't quite, sometimes it's strange, sorry, I'm not explaining very well, but sometimes like I can work, like I can write a kids' picture book, like stories for kids' pictures books. Um, at the same time, while I'm writing um, horror or like mm -hmm. thrillers or whatever other kind of like novel format uh, works uh, in the same time frame, I mean, at the same kind of period, say if I'm working, <laughs> I get an idea at night and or I wake up in the morning for a dream and uh, from a dream, and I just write down um, a short story, um, which was the case with Miss Camellia and the Hugel Culture Mound, my second kids picture book. Um, but yeah, it's like because they're shorter, so it takes shorter time in a way to yeah. write it. But then you have to edit it to make sure you're happy with the finished material, and then the illustrations add to that. When you have a longer, a longer story like a novella or a novel, and it's also more traumatic material, it can be quite difficult. As I was mentioning, whispers is quite. It's a collection of short stories and it has 12 stories, but they're, they're in a way, I think they're similar, but at the same time, they're quite different. Each one mm -hmm. of them, um, uh, that collection was written as a um, suggestion coming from um, Felix Blackwell. He recommended writing on and posting the stories on Reddit, which I hadn't okay, yeah. used at the time. It was like for the no sleep community. Yeah. So it was aimed at like horror stories written in the first person and like scary stuff. But so obviously they're fiction, but many of the mm, bits in those stories, they're from my life, obviously. I mean, obviously maybe it's not obvious for other people, but I think each writer puts himself in each story he writes. Yeah. If it's a, like a, 
not necessarily like well written story, but like if you've put your heart in it, your heart in it, I think you've put something from your life experience in that story as little as mm -hmm. possible. So it's quite it was quite a it was a good book to write, but at the same time there were lots of themes in there that was quite traumatic. So at, in 2020, I just wanted to focus on more positive books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. On and not that the other one is not like positive in other aspects, but I think you know what I mean. It's like kids' picture books tend to be more uplifting, and I, yeah. felt, I felt like the year needed that kind of those kinds of stories. So, and personally, I needed those as well. Yeah, um, um, yeah no, I think it's interesting. Uh, it's funny how, as you say, when it's like been a tougher year or whatever, that you're, I suppose you're like naturally attracted to just writing something a bit more lighthearted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as, a, I think, as a sort of an escape. Yeah, exactly. This, I think you can, sometimes that's, that's why I was saying it's weird because sometimes I can work on a psychological novel at the same in the same time frame mm. as I'm writing a kids picture book because that's a short format and you know um, although mine tend to be a bit longer than the classical kids picture books <laughs> uh, like a thousand words or three thousand well maybe not three thousand words but uh, around a thousand words so it's uh, it's just it, it kind of you have to be in the zone as well you have to be in that story like if I'm writing uh, like I was working on Tender is the Rain several years ago, a novel which I still haven't finished because it's a kind of, I don't know, it's just messes with my mind. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Karina ludmilla Cristea, and it's time for a little bit more music. So this is Friends Like You by The Phenomenots and this is a live performance. I think I was actually at this gig. <laughs>
wish I could set these feelings along with you. Shed these feelings and run Friends Like You by Phenomenarts. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with this week's guest, who is indie author Krino Ludmilla Christea. Uh, cool. So uh, another thing I want to ask you about is uh, you have an interest in photography as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I guess, well, do you, how long have you been taking photographs and, um, you know, what got you interested in it? Wow. Well, I haven't done photography like professionally in, since maybe 2018, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but what got me started, I would say, well, after I finished uh, university, during the university as well, um, but after university, I was obviously, as many other people, <laughs> looking for a job because I was working in a restaurant at the time during mm-hmm. my studies. Um and a Belgian restaurant in Canterbury, which doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. And uh, I was looking for a different kind of job that's geared up towards what I like doing more, like writing, photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've kind of, I've always um, thought about stories in terms of images. So when I write, I see images, like I mm-hmm. see how the light falls, um, how it rains, uh, different uh, points of views. That's kind of how I think about the stories as well. So I was doing um, portraiture for a while because there's people who need like headshots, uh, not, as, not just like port- portraiture can be a bit more broad, but especially for headshots, there's people like business people, there's actors who mm. need headshots like professionally done because it's like it's, it's it's not sad, but it's a bit disappointing that in a time like this, so many people still don't have good pictures of themselves, mm. especially those who are, uh, say, business owners or they have like a, maybe a small business. Maybe it's just like you and me, they're independent mm. authors and they want to represent themselves well. It's like it's, it helps to have a good picture of yourself yeah. like professionally 
done picture and by professional i don't mean it has to be how like hundreds of pounds worth you don't have to have like mm. a very expensive session you just have to have to work with a photographer or even with yourself if you're a bit more good at that or maybe a partner to work with the light well and get a good headshot yeah you know, like natural light is very very good especially if you have like a good um uh, like an opaque window or like a, a drape is that mm -hmm. the right word yeah. uh, so the light is a bit filtered and it helps your skin to soften the skin a bit and just it's very <laughs> I don't know if you've uh, you've probably seen my Instagram picture that's a picture we taken with my phone in mm -hmm. front of a window and uh, lots of people commented that they like that picture <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very cheap picture taken I've taken it myself yeah. So I, I think it, ha it helps people. So I was trying to do something that brings me some money while I'm helping other people. But obviously, it, it depends. It, with the photography, it can be difficult. My, my heart, I would say, is more in writing yeah. rather than photography because I'm quite... I wouldn't say I'm an introvert, <laughs> but I'm a bit more... Um, I keep to myself a bit more. I like yeah. being with other people, but... After that, I, I need time to recuperate. I don't know if you're like that. <laughs> yeah, but for sure. I like being around people, but at the same time, I get exhausted so quickly and I just need to rest and read and have time to, for myself. So for that kind of being, I think needs to have a, a job mm. that allows to be a bit more, um, I don't know, you need a different kind of uh, job or experience. Uh, work different kind of work yeah yeah it makes sense and um I, it's, so it's interesting because um you saying that as well that that i suppose that's how you write is that you see things as well yeah. um because they always say with writing it's better to show than to tell don't they and do yeah. you think that gives you an advantage that you're such a visual person do you think it's maybe easier for you to show because of that I'm not sure if it gives me an advantage because even if you're not like a visually oriented person, you can be good at writing in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes this might be an obstacle. If you think too visually, you might yeah. you might be too um, precise in your writing and just write from that kind of. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know, it might come a bit uh, stilted sometimes yeah. if you're not careful. So you have to in integrate <laughs> your your writing. But it's just, it's a way of thinking, because I did uh, a little bit, I did one course of screenwriting when I was mm -hmm. at university. And it helps to think, because a story is a story. If, if it's a script, if it's a novel, a radio play, whatever, Obviously, it differs in some ways how it's formatted, but the story is a story. So when you read it, the audience, even if they're like just listening to it or watch, obviously, if they're watching it, it's a bit more um, different because you have the visuals and the sounds, but it should, the, the text should stand on its own. And it's good to have a variety uh, of points of view in terms of how the reader or the listener um, the reader, let's refer to the reader, so, uh, sees the the action and whatever is going on in the story. I think it helps to have like close-ups and sometimes wider shots in terms of like you see the world from afar uh, and then you go in closer to the character. Um, so I try to balance that in a way yeah. to, to give that kind of, but hopefully I'm doing it okay and i'll hopefully do it better in the future <laughs> but we'll, i don't know i guess we'll see how well, people feel about it <laughs> well i suppose it's one of those things as well where you, you want to leave enough for the reader to you know interpret it themselves so if you're if you're too specific with how you're describing things you know it's the same with when, whenever you see um i hate it when you when you pick up a book and there's like one of the characters is on the cover because then it automatically kind of forces you to think of the character in that specific way, you know? So I think it works best when there's room for interpretation. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's, <laughs> I don't quite like when you have the characters <laughs> on the cover. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's romance, horror, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just, I feel like it takes away from the story. Um, by the way, because I mentioned the book I've been reading for the last few weeks. 
because uh, I'm a bit of a slow lead, reader. <laughs> I do other things in between. And uh, the never-ending story. Mm -hmm. I know people, um, they've seen the movie and they said, uh, the person who initially recommended the book to me, she said it's her favorite book. She said she didn't like the movie. Mm. And I, I know how difficult it can be to make a movie. Uh, but I can I understand. So I appreciate when an, an adaptation is even attempted. But at the same time, yeah, I can be critical if it's not done well. But especially, I think I would try to avoid seeing, like, if I, I'm enjoying the novel a lot, right? So I don't think I'm going to go and see the film, mm. or like the movie, because I like the story so much and because it's so fantastical. I think it's hard to put on screen all those elements uh, because technology, although it's quite advanced at the moment, it's still, like, there's the mm. book, the written material leaves so much more to the imagination. and But to give an example in terms of adaptations, for example, I read Call Me By Your Name by Andrea Simon maybe in 2017, something like that. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is <laughs> such a great novel. And then uh, I was quite... I wanted to see the movie, but then I was like, oh, I don't know, if, what if I don't like it? And then I how I found out who was um, cast as the main, uh, the people who, the actors who were cast as the main characters. And I was like, oh, isn't that guy too old to play the other character? Oh, how is that going to play on screen? And actually, when I saw the movie, I don't know if you've seen it. Maybe. Oh, I haven't, no. Oh, you, I recommend it. <laughs> it's a very good book and movie. Uh, they both stand on their own and it's very a uh, faithful adaptation. Uh, but in terms of the movie, like I liked one of the characters better in the in the book and the other character more in the movie. I felt like it was more developed in the movie, although he didn't necessarily do more from a term in, from the terms uh, point from the point of view of the plot. But I just felt like it was a bit more real than in the book because the book is written from the uh, first person of one of the characters who's the younger guy. And I was like, in the in the movie, they were like such a, I don't know, they balanced the, themselves uh, so well. And then the movie has such a great ending. Uh, I don't know if I felt the same way about the end of the book, mm. but for me, they were very good, um, good stories. What have you got planned next? And where can people follow you to stay up to date with it? Well, I'll start with your second question. Okay. Um, I think the best way to find me is on my Instagram, which mm -hmm. is at Lily Bloom Writer. Um, but uh, I have a Facebook page as well, which is Krina Ludmila Christia Autor. But obviously that's longer, so I think it's mm -hmm. more difficult for people to, rem to remember. I'm also on Twitter, or Lily, Bloom, Lily Bloom Writer. Um, I have a website as well, but the best way to find me is on Instagram and then you can find links to my website. Yeah. Obviously, for people who are looking for books, they can go on different sites like, um, I don't know if we can give names. But, <laughs> yeah, we can, the usual uh, okay, Amazon. Can Amazon, <laughs> also my latest book, uh, which is, uh, was published uh, using Ingram Spark as well, mm -hmm. uh, but only in Romanian, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is my na native language. So, yeah, that's plenty, but the easiest way is to go to Instagram. And what was that? Oh, what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing, <laughs> the thing is, at the moment, I'm doing uh, different things, not necessarily to do with writing. I'm trying to sort out some official documentation. I'm trying to uh, get the documents ready to apply for my citizenship, mm -hmm. for my British citizenship. So I'm trying to get those done so I can have it done and be done with it. <laughs> uh, but I've got several books started, uh, novels actually, mm -hmm. but I haven't worked on those because they're a different kind of like, they're a bit more psychological. Two of them are like romance, but still quite traumatic. Uh, but the, the project that I would really like to publish this year is another kid's book. <laughs> called Arthur the Frightened Bunny. Hmm. And people can listen to the story on YouTube if, if they um, type it. Um, I've recorded myself reading it so they can listen to it. I'm trying to like 
save money to pay my illustrator to to have the illustrations done and mm. to put the book together because the story is written i only have to recheck it uh, just maybe um, re-edit it in case although i've re-edited several times yeah uh, just because once you've got the illustrations um obviously sometimes certain things might have to be taken out from the written story. Although yeah. I'm quite happy with how the story is at the moment. I mean, last time I checked it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in terms of what the story is about, <laughs> in case you're interested, it's a, it's a story about anxiety and friendship. So we have a character, the Arthur, who's a cute bunny, who has deals with uh, certain anxiety things going on in his life. And... He has to go on in the forest in the search of his friends. So that's kind of how the adventure starts. But I think it's a very cute story. So I hope people will listen mm. to it on YouTube and let me know what they think of it. Because so, I'm, I'm looking forward to publishing that one. But we'll see when it will happen. Because yeah. it's in terms of getting the right money to, to publish yeah. it. Big thanks to Karina Ludmilla Cristea for joining us. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for a little bit more music. This is Finding My Song by Heather Inns. Finding my voice in a foreign land Finding my song so important to do Sing from my heart, that's the clue Love myself, love my neighbour too Come sing with me, and together we'll find Harmony sweet and pure to the ear Peace of mind and nothing to fear Stories to tell, new stories to hear Finding my voice in a foreign land Finding my song so important to do Sing from my heart that's the clue, love myself, love my neighbour too. The call of the sea brought me here, silver waters shine in the sun. Evening mist creeps over the loch, invisible fields, fascinating stuff. Finding my voice in a foreign land, Finding my song so important to do Sing from my heart, that's the clue Love myself, love my neighbour too Songs and stories in Crawford's bar Open mic on a harbour stage Sing Mara choir to meet new friends Finding my song just never ends Finding my voice in a foreign land Finding my song so important to do Sing from my heart, that's the clue Love myself, love my neighbour too Looking for a high quality workspace to let including serviced offices, workshops and studios with over 30 managed office spaces in the UK, here at Basepoint Business Centres, we have spaces suitable for almost any business use imaginable. Our very flexible, easy in and easy out terms let you save time and money when compared to conventionally leased space. Call us on 0208 068 9158 or visit basepoint.co.uk to learn about our great offers and benefits. We'll be happy to help. Basepoint, one company, many solutions. It's just the flu. You hear people say it every year, but if you're immunosuppressed, have a learning disability or have a condition such as multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, motor neurone or Parkinson's, there's no just about it. Flu is a virus that can cause serious complications. That's why we offer you the flu jab free. It's your very best protection. Ask your pharmacist or GP today. NHS. We're here to help you protect against flu. Did you know there's a new council coming for Buckinghamshire? From the 1st of April, the new Buckinghamshire Council will replace the existing county and district councils. 
Don't worry, your bins will still be collected. We'll continue to run libraries, maintain the roads, look after vulnerable adults and children, and there'll be all the day-to-day -day services you are used to. One Council will make it simpler for you. We'll be able to improve services together and give you better value for money. Buckinghamshire Council. Your Buckinghamshire, your Council. A better future together. Milk and Alcohol by Radio Generation. My name is Dane Cobain, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. Not really sure why I played a song called Milk and Alcohol because I'm vegan and teetotal so, so I can't drink either of those things. But hey ho. Uh, we've reached that part of the show where we head over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford who's going to share an album review with us. So over to Twanglin' Jack Ford. The Constant Pageant by The Trembling Bells. In the 60s, American rock musicians started to fuse their sound with American folk music and country and came up with what we now know as Americana. Americana is usually a fairly pleasant musical experience. Influenced by this, musicians from these islands fused the contemporary with the traditional and came up with something much darker, songs about savage retribution, violent civil unrest and spooky folklore. If you take the sound of British folk rock pioneers like Fairport Convention and Steel Ice Span 
and you add the distortion, the energy and the anarchic sensibilities of punk, garage rock and West Coast psychedelia, you end up with the trembling bells. The crystal clear purity of lead singer Lavinia Blackwell's vocal delivery is easily a match for the past giants of folk rock, Sandy Denny and Maddie Pryor, as she battles against an unruly sonic barrage that is about as analogue as you can get in this digital age. She also plays a convincing rock and roll piano. They journey between pure melody and wild atonal freak out noise, catchy pop songs and haunting folk melodies. I was unsure which of the albums to suggest and I checked the sleeve notes to find the date, which is 2011, and I found it is dedicated to Don Van Vliet, better known as Captain Beefheart. So this had to be the one. The Constant Pageant. Thank you very much, Twanglin' Jack Ford, for sharing this week's album review. My name's Dean Cobain, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM at Wickham Sound. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You can also find us on iTunes, Spotify, etc. Just search for The Art Show Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And uh, you can email me here at the studio, dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. We've reached the end of this week's show, so I want to say a big thank you to everyone involved, all of the musicians, big thank you to Twanglin' Jack Ford as well. And I'm going to leave you with one of Twanglin' Jack Ford's tunes. Uh, his file naming is terrible, I'm going to, going to put that out there on the radio. So, I think this is just called Handfuls, but it might be called Handfuls of Something, but I'm not too sure. Uh, this is Twanglin' Jack Ford, anyway, I will see you next week.
This is Wickham Sound 